Can you tell us where does Insurgents come in, this, this latest book that you've written? It seems to me that it's more than just a book. So what's the origin story? I appreciate the question, Andrew. And the theme that runs through all of my work is the answer to the question, there must be more than this. In other words, many Christians have deep within their beating chest this inquiry. When they get exposed to church, when they get exposed to uh, the Christian books that are out there, particularly the popular ones, when they get exposed to Christian podcasts, television, radio, for many, many believers, there is this aching, nagging question and that says, there's got to be more to the Christian life than this, more to <laughs> right. the Lord than this. There's got to be more to our understanding of Scripture than this. And that was exactly the heart cry of my own soul when I was in my early 20s. And it led me into what I call the deeper journey. And I discovered that there is something called the deeper Christian life, a term coined by Andrew Murray, one of the, one of the great writers of the 1800s. And when I came into the deeper things of God, it just blew my mind uh, because I saw the Lord like I never had before. There were aspects of him that were so exciting, so powerful, so mind-blowing, and also things in the scripture that I'd never seen before. And so my work is written to the Christian that is not satisfied with his or her spiritual life, with church as we know it. And in their hearts, they know that there's got to be something deeper. There's got to be something higher. There's got to be something beyond. That's who I'm writing to, and everything I, I've written comes out of my own personal journey, the things I've discovered, the things that have been helpful to me, the solutions to problems I've had as a believer over the years. And uh, that's one of the reasons why all of the books have really done well. And this new one, you ask, you know, kind of the story behind it. This new one is now being called my signature work, and I believe that that is true that Insurgents, Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom is probably the most important book I will write. I have never in my life received so many testimonies of life change, of altered hearts, than, than I have from this book. And, I, and I've written many books that have you know, generated lots of wonderful testimonials, uh, as well as a lot of hate mail <laughs> from people who are not willing to be challenged or they're encased in their traditions. But insurgents, uh, particularly among leaders and pastors and young people, the book has absolutely wrecked. And I mean that in a good way, many, many a believer. And that's exactly what the message did to me before I put it in print. It seems to be, Andrew, what God is breathing on right now. You know, every once in a while, they'll, they'll come a book and out of it, they'll come a podcast and out of it, they'll come a, a I don't want to say movement because I'm not a fan of movements, but there'll be a move of the Lord associated with it. And so I, I titled this Insurgence because there is an insurgence happening. We could talk about that word later on in the body of Christ. And the book seems to be uh, the symbol of that or it's sort of the gateway, the gateway drug, so to speak, to this thing that, that God seems to be up to. You know, I, I really appreciate that. Um... And I, I've definitely experienced that in, in reading your works or listening to some of the, the messages that you, you have at your website. And I really see that that is the case, that, that we have these really basic foundational things like what does it mean to be a disciple? Um, what is the church? And in this case, uh, what really caught my attention with your book is it's called Insurgents, but then the subtitle is Reclaiming the Gospel of the Kingdom. And that idea of reclaiming something so central as the gospel message itself, and specifically the gospel of the kingdom, mm -hmm. um, really resonates with me. So why did you see that as, as a need, that the gospel, and specifically the gospel of the kingdom, was something that needed to be reclaimed? When I started to look into the kingdom of God in Scripture, this is about 10 years ago, I did a study on it because I wanted to find out what, is, what does the Bible really say about this business of the kingdom of God? We know Jesus talked an awful lot about the kingdom. It was his central message. 
but what does the rest of the scripture have to say and how does it fit together? And so I began to look at it not topically in the sense of systematically. I looked at it narratively. I looked at it from Genesis to Revelation in in chronological order, and I noticed things that I would have never noticed if I did it uh, systematically, as most theology is taught systematically these days, not narratively. Mm -hmm. And so many things jumped out. There's a story to be told, and I unveil the story in the book, and some things are just amazing, uh, you know, that, that I had uncovered, amazing to me and, and to other readers based on feedback. So consequently, I realized that this thing called the gospel of the kingdom that was on the lips of Jesus and the apostles, Paul, Peter, etc., had been lost to us. I realized, I, I, I thought to myself, this gospel is not being preached today. Anytime little bits and pieces of it get presented, because that is true, there are bits and pieces of the gospel of the kingdom that are presented here and there, it's always couched in legalism. It's always brought with a condemning tone. And at the end of the day, readers kind of, you know, hide under the bed with a flashlight because, uh, you know, they're not doing enough. They're falling short. They're just living under a pile of guilt. And so I saw that the gospel of the kingdom, on the one hand, was incredibly challenging scarily challenging, but on the other hand, incredibly freeing and liberating. And so my goal in presenting the gospel of the kingdom, which I do believe needs to be reclaimed and is being reclaimed right now in the day in which we live, my goal was to do it in such a way where the challenge and the, and the bleeding edge was not removed on the one hand, but also that the message would not have a, an ounce of guilt or condemnation or legalism associated with it. And that was that fine needle that I was trying to walk in presenting it. That I hope that, uh, that I pulled it off. Yeah, I, I really like that. It seems to me that uh, a lot of times, you know, we have this, this very, you know, Jesus said that, um, that narrow is the gate that leads to life and fewer those who, who enter by it. Um, and yet it, it seems to me that a lot of times the way we approach things is there's this broad door that we present people with the gospel. Uh, and then we try to, to narrow it down once people walk through it. Is that, uh, is that something that, that you see happening? Have we basically separated the gospel from discipleship? And is that something that you're trying to address with this book? I would say that's a simplified way of putting it. I'm doing a whole lot more than that. Being a disciple and being a convert and being a believer are all synonymous in the New Testament. In the 19th century, in the mid-19th century, the two were separated. And so what ended up happening was there were certain teachers that, and their teaching caught on big, hmm. that said that you can be a convert and that's free grace and that's easy, but it, being a disciple is optional and that's hard. Hmm. And yet the New Testament does not separate the two. And here's the thing about it. Look, people who are in the flesh are going to do whatever they can to justify their way of life. And so if that means torturing the Bible to make it fit one's doctrine, that's what happens. But the fact of the matter is, if you torture the Scripture enough, it will confess to anything. Hmm. We have to look at the Scripture as a whole and not as verses taken out of context and pasted together to build a doctrine that accommodates our lifestyle or accommodates what we feel is easy. Bonhoeffer did something like this with his book called Discipleship. Later, it was, was renamed The Cost of Discipleship. And some of the insights he had were correct. Now, this is a totally different book, and it covers much different ground. But related to your question, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you cannot be a convert of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a Christian, quote unquote, which was a name that the followers of Jesus didn't call themselves. It was given to them by observers in the city of Antioch. You cannot be a um, believer and not be a disciple, not be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean we follow his teachings only. That means we, we follow him. You know, he's still alive. Right. So there's a big push today in our time, particularly uh, out of one particular camp that says, well, it's all about following Jesus. And that means we read what he said, and then we try to obey it. Well, no, that's not what the early Christians understood 
following Jesus to mean. They actually believe that he was still alive in the Spirit, and we follow the Spirit. That's why Paul says those who are led by the Spirit, those who follow the Spirit are the sons of God. He's still alive, and he will lead us in a way that completely maps to what he taught. Right. You can't separate him from his teaching. But on the other hand, you can't divorce his teaching from him. And that, that's another book that I've written with a gentleman named Leonard Sweet, who's a professor at several uh, seminaries. And we wrote a book together called Jesus Manifesto. And it was all about the fact that you cannot separate the teachings of Jesus from Jesus himself, that he's still alive and he's come to indwell every believer every disciple by the Spirit, and it is the Spirit, it is the indwelling life of Christ that we follow and live by. And that was one of the big points of the book. But you cannot be a convert and not be a disciple. That doesn't mean you're perfect. That doesn't mean you're not in need of daily transformation. That doesn't mean you don't have any struggles. But it does mean that there has been a crisis situation where you have basically married Jesus Christ, okay, if you want to put it that way, you know? The husband can't say to his wife, well, you know, is it okay if I... um." If I remain true to you seven days out of the week, but uh, occasionally, uh, maybe on the fifth day, I'm not, you know, um, that wouldn't fly with any woman. It wouldn't fly with any man. And it doesn't fly with the Lord. Here's the truth. The kingdom of God in its fullness is certainly a future event, a future phenomenon. But with the resurrection of Jesus, the future has been brought into the present. Therefore, that's why the New Testament talks about the kingdom as being both past and present, both yesterday and today, that the kingdom can be experienced now, that it's available to people now. And yet, it's really a future event, so the future is being brought into the present. We live as Christians, as disciples of Jesus, we are learning to live in the presence of the future. And that's what Paul had on his mind constantly when he was writing to the churches. I would really agree with that. I think uh, this book does an, an incredible job of of just putting the pieces on, on the playing board in a way that makes sense and, and that I think is true to the reality that we see around us. But it al- also you know, very clearly offers up what you might call a third way. Uh, how do we live as as citizens of of a heavenly colony that that really doesn't belong to any other uh, system here on earth that that we are uh, what you describe as the third race? Um, there's an amazing chapter that you have in there where you talk about when the the question was posed to Jesus about should we pay taxes to Caesar, and you talked about the uh, the likeness whose likeness is on that coin. Um, and just great. I hope people get this this book because I think they're going to be really in cha- challenged, but also encouraged mm. and get some insights that maybe they haven't heard anywhere else in uh, the Christian world today. Um, you know, let's um, let's dig a little bit deeper into the, the kingdom of God itself. You make a statement in the book um, where you say that when we when we try to understand the kingdom by defining it, it's really it's really a fool's errand. You're never going to get a, a clear understanding of the kingdom if you just try to define it. What you have to do is you have to describe it. And you do a great job of that in the book where you offer just a number of, of what you might call vignettes of, of the kingdom of God that help us begin to get all the, uh, the multifaceted dimensions of the kingdom. So can you talk a little bit more about that? What's the difference between just trying to define the kingdom and what's the danger of, of limiting our understanding to a definition versus really having it described? Well, first of all, um, I'm taking my cue there from Jesus and Paul. Uh, Jesus incessantly spoke on the kingdom of God. In fact, if you count, and I do it in the book, if you count the number of times he he used the phrase, the kingdom, without overlap and without repetition, it comes out to be almost 90 times in the gospel. So it was pervasive in his ministry, but he never defined it, ever. (laughs) What he did, though, is he illustrated it constantly. He said, uh, the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of God is similar to, how shall I compare the kingdom of God? Well, it's kind of like this. 
<laughs> and Paul did the same thing, and but then Paul went a step further and he told us what the kingdom of God was not. So the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking. So we find out that the way they spoke about the kingdom was on the one hand, they, they wouldn't define it. On the other hand, they illustrated it. And so that's what I do in the book as well, giving contemporary illustrations of what the kingdom is. Uh, one of them comes from my own state, Florida, the Magic Kingdom. I talk about how the Magic Kingdom is an illustration of entering into the kingdom of God. It has to be illustrated. Once you define it, you drain it from its power, you limit it, you dilute it. Once you define it, you basically have, have removed its robustness because what ends up happening is that people take that definition, which is too limited to contain the dynamic, titanic, earth-shaking power and glory and majesty of the kingdom in an Aristotelian linear sentence. And so it ends up hurting the whole message. We have been trained to believe that memorizing a definition is the equivalent of experiencing what we're defining. And so the idea being, okay, I know what the kingdom is. Here's the definition. Therefore, subconsciously, I've experienced it. I've got it. Let's move on to something else. And that's exactly what happens with Westerners. You cannot do justice by defining it. I do actually have a one sentence description of it, but that's after and before illustrating it over and over again in different ways. <laughs> But I will tell you this, that everyone so far who's written me, read the book, says I'm finally clear on what the kingdom of God is and, and the gospel of the kingdom, which is a huge, humbling compliment. It's one of those things where I guess it depends on what, what circles that, that you move around in. But, you know, the kingdom of God is, it's almost something that uh, I know just in my own experience, it's not something you hear talked about much at all. Uh, certainly not to the extent that you see Jesus talking about it in the Gospels or, or even the the New Testament writers and John in the book of Revelation. It doesn't even necessarily get referenced. I'm not sure we know where it fits for us as modern day, uh, predominantly Gentile believers. Um, can can you say, can you say, how do you see the the kingdom of God and the church or ecclesia how do you see these two things connected? How do they fit together? That's an excellent question because, unfortunately, most of the people who've taught on the kingdom of God over the last 50 years have made this dramatic separation from church and kingdom. In other words, they've said that the kingdom is something totally separate from the church. That statement is true, and it's also false. It's true if you, if you define church as a Sunday morning service, or you define church as a denomination, or you define church as a building, or you define church as all the Christians in the world, then you're right. The church is not the kingdom, and the kingdom is not the church. Those two things are completely separate. But if you define the word church as it appears in the English New Testament as ecclesia, which is the Greek term for it. And ecclesia meant a local body of believers that lived in face-to-face -face community and had a shared life together and took care of each other and loved one another and knew each other in the sense that they saw themselves as family, despite racial division, despite economic division, despite sexual division, you know, meaning men, men and women included. If you see it as that living, breathing, close-knit, extended family, all of whom were living by the life of Jesus Christ, then brother and sister listening, <laughs> That was the kingdom of God on this planet because, and the New Testament is very clear about this in the book of Revelation, he made us a kingdom. <laughs> That's saying that the people of God were the king. See, a kingdom refers to the king, 
the king's domain, and the people who are ruled by the king. That's what a kingdom is. Right. It includes the people who are ruled by the king. So in the first century, if I was living, say, in, oh, the region of Galatia in, say, the year 49, well, say 50 AD, and I wanted to find the kingdom of God, where I would go is I would go to the city of Antioch of Pisidia, or I would go to the city of Lystra, or I would go to um, the town of Derby, or I would go to the city of Iconium, and I would see a group of believers in all four towns, all four cities, that were living a shared life together, who were living by the life of Jesus Christ, and that was the kingdom of God in those four cities. That was the presence of the future uh, right there before my eyes. And, you know, in the Old Testament, we have the picture of this, which is repeated in the book of Peter. But in Exodus, God says to Israel, I will make you a kingdom of priests. In other words, I will make you a royal priesthood. I will make you a kingdom. I use that term, a kingdom of priests, those who live in my presence. And then Peter picks this up and he speaks to the body of Christ. And he says, he has made you a holy nation. He's made you a royal priesthood. He's made you a kingdom. So you cannot separate the ecclesia from the kingdom of God, just like you cannot separate Jesus Christ from the kingdom of God. If you wanted to see the kingdom of God in, say, 32 AD, you just have to look for Jesus, because wherever Jesus is, there's the kingdom. And just think about the logic here. He is, this is the biblical logic. He ascends into heaven, and what does he do? He descends in the spirit, and now he gives his life. He breathes his own indwelling life into his followers, and now they become a corporate expression of Christ. They are Christ on the earth. The New Testament makes this clear over and over again. So that's the kingdom of God. Wherever you find these people living together, expressing Christ together, there's the kingdom. Just like when Jesus was here as an individual before he rose again from the dead, if you wanted to see the kingdom, you found Jesus. So after he yeah. rose again from the dead, if you wanted to see the kingdom, you see this people who are having a shared life together, who are living by Christ, manifesting Christ, expressing Christ, there's the kingdom. And that has been lost to us, because this gets yeah. into another, another cutting edge of the kingdom, Andrew, and that is the kingdom of God is an alternative civilization in the midst of fallen human civilization. It lives completely different. It has different values, different customs, a different way of life, and it shows us what it means for God to be king over a people, and that's what the ecclesia is. That's very different from going to church on Sunday morning, where most people don't even know one another. They leave, they go home, and what do they do? They live their own individual Christian life. Very different from the first century ecclesia. Yeah, I, I love it, man. Um, and and I really, I really do hope people not only pick up the book, but um, if they're not already, that they begin to follow some of your work, particularly your work there on the blog. I was blown away. I mean, you have the exercises at the end of each chapter, but then there are just um, a wealth of resources that you have at your at your website that is it is basically a a parallel for the book, where people can go audio messages. Um, Articles that you've written that that further dive into different topics. You, you've got one on how to break an addiction, mm -hmm. which I think so many people, uh, so many of us would benefit from. It's not in the book, but you talk about it some, and then you refer people to an additional resource. It's just, uh, it's it's an amazing um, work that you're doing, not just with the book, but just across uh, the platform. So. I know we're running short on time here, so as uh, as we kind of wrap it up, that's probably a, a, a good question to ask is, what are your prayers and hopes for this book, and, and where do you see this thing going? How can people be a part of it? You know, I, I take it very seriously. I, I think that the Lord is definitely doing something in terms of reclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The impact it's having on readers is is beyond what I had expected or even foreseen. And I, I take it seriously in the sense that um, I have written supplementary articles that you mentioned put on uh, the website that's mentioned in the book. So when, when readers are going through the book, it you know, there might be a little note that says, you know, go to the website 
and uh, read hmm. this chapter, whether it's addictions or political elections or whatever it may be, uh, because we couldn't we couldn't fit it all into the book. The publisher had hmm. to stop it where it was. So we just put them on a supplementary website, which, as you say, has audios and so forth. There's even a master class that goes along with it. But my hope is that I, I just got to tell you, I, I wish this book landed in my hands when I was a young believer. I just wish that every Christian who is hungry for the Lord, who wants all that he has, who wants to go further in their spiritual life, will read the book. It's very easy yeah, to read. The chapters are one to two pages long. I, I did that deliberately so people can you know read it quickly. And then just join the insurgents, be part of what what God is doing. And, and when they read the book, they'll understand what that means. Get plugged into uh, the blog and the website. You know, I'm writing every Thursday to, to those who've joined the insurgents. We got some live events planned and God willing in the future. The people will connect with one another who are on the same journey, who are really interested in responding to the gospel of the kingdom and living that journey out together to find others of like mind and like heart. So that's really my heart and intention. Now, people want to just check out some samples of the book and look at different uh, online stores that have it on discount. They can just go to insurgents.org, one word, insurgents.org, and there's interviews on that site. There's reviews, there's samples, there's endorsements, and they can get a feel for it and get the book on discount if they want to order it online. Amazon has it, etc. Well, our, our listeners know that Into the Harvest is all about taking the message and mission of Jesus out of the building and into the everyday of life, which is where the Lord always intended us to to be His people and to live as His people. And I couldn't recommend your book, Insurgents, uh, any higher because I think it's it's on the cutting edge of of what God is doing in our world today, uh, which is stirring his people to, uh, to take these steps. And it's just a, an amazing resource that you have there.